Good morning, or good afternoon, wherever we are in the world. I am Matthew Holt, and I am uh, the publisher, founder uh, of the Healthcare Blog. I also founded the Health 2.0 conference, and it's been quite a while now, but about 30 years that I've been looking at health and health technology. And I'm delighted to talk to you all about, um, uh, and we'll take, spend about uh, 25, 30 minutes, talking about the future of health technology, particularly in reference to what's just happened with COVID-19 going around the world. So if you're ready for that, that's what I prepped and I'm looking forward to talking to you all this morning. Okay, so let's go. So I'm gonna to talk to you all, and here's my details on the screen, about the continuous clinic, what's gonna happen after COVID-19 and building that continuous clinic. What do I mean by this? Well, obviously we've got a big, big change in the world over the last uh, few months. But what's really been happening is we've been building on an infrastructure rollout that has been uh, taking place quietly in the background in healthcare, much more so outside of healthcare, over the last 20 or even 30 years, particularly over the last decade or so. Nonetheless, COVID is the problem that is right in front of us, and I want to focus on that for a second. Uh, I'm going to do this particularly from an American point of view. Yes, I'm a Brit, but I've been living in the U.S. for more than 30 years, and we have particular problems in America, but they are reflected elsewhere because, in general, healthcare systems are not set up to deal with our two major problems, which the new one of infectious diseases and the old one of chronic care management. So you see a bunch of headlines here. Hospitals in the U.S. are losing money because they are having to take care of patients with infectious disease rather than doing their regular, regular, uh, regular uh, uh, types of surgeries and procedures. We call them elective in the U.S. Um, we've seen a lot more use of telehealth, and I'll touch on that as I go through the presentation. But really, we haven't seen much of this virtual care, or remote care uh, in the U.S. a little bit, but uh, around the edges. It's been around for a while, but it hasn't been uh, used much. Used much more during the recent, uh, the recent and current pandemic. Meanwhile, various parts of the American system are really falling apart because of the way they get paid. Uh, particularly primary care practices here get paid by pa seeing patients come in. Those patients haven't been going in because they've been locked down or been scared to come into the clinic. Um, their revenues have gone down. Meanwhile, in America in particular, and this is the case somewhere else in some other parts of the world, uh, insurance and access to healthcare comes via your job. And of course, many people lost their jobs in the current recession based on coronavirus. So that's been a big problem as well. So what's going to come to our rescue? Well, I like to think of uh, a TV show that I was a kid, an American show that was really famous, um, starring Lee Majors as an astronaut who had a crash. Um, so I'm going to show you a bit of a video here. You may or may not recognize this opening, one of the classics from the 70s. Listen to the next phrase. We can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic man. So in the TV show, The Six Million Dollar Man, they turned Steve Austin, astronaut, into a bionic man with a new arm, new eyes, new legs, all that kind of good stuff. We have the opportunity to do that with our healthcare system, and that's really what is going to happen next. Why do I say this? Well, what I'm talking about here is that the entire healthcare economy has been extreme, incredibly static for many, many years and many centuries in how we've done things. And yet the rest of the economy has changed dramatically and provided us with a huge amount of different and diverse technology. I don't mean so much that, America, that the healthcare system has not used technology such as uh, CT scanners and imaging and surgery techniques. That's been going on a plenty. We use that kind of technology in healthcare. We haven't really used management technology, information technology, as dramatically as many other industries. So I, my argument here that I co-developed with my co-founder co -founder at Health 2.0 in New Sabaya is that technology is going to change the new healthcare economy. <coughs> what do I mean by that? Well, back in the old days, and I'm talking about 10,000 years ago, when we first uh, started you know, developing society, we had a thing called care delivery, which was a clinician, and a patient, a doctor and a patient, a witch doctor, a barbershop surgeon, whoever it was, in the same place at the same time with one of them doing something to the other. And that's our care delivery model. 
And you go across the world, basically, that's the same care delivery model we have now. Doctor and patient, doctor and uh, healthcare provider, in the same time, in the same place, one of them doing something to the other. That clearly is not how we run the rest of the world. Now, a few years later, um, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we started adding, depending where you are, we started adding services on top of that. And these may be nutrition advice lines, coaching, telephone advice lines, uh, home visits, a bunch of other tools and services were developed. But really, they, they were added on top of that uh, initial doctor-patient visit or doctor patient or procedure or hospital admission, which was really the core of the healthcare system. Now, it took a long time in the US about you know, 20 years ago and more predominantly around 10 years ago, we added technology essentially to track what had been going on in those other areas, what kind of care delivery was done. And in many areas of the world, uh, including most of Europe, some of the US and much of Asia, a lot of that technology is used to try and figure out what happens so you can send somebody a bill and get paid. My argument is that now that technology has become so pervasive, the different types of technology that are going everywhere, including broadband to the home, technology, the internet, sensors, all different types of tracking devices, they're getting so pre prevalent that we're actually starting to build a technology platform that we're going to deliver healthcare on top of. So that tech infrastructure, which I mentioned, which has been developed by many huge organizations you know well, including the uh, big tech giants, whether it be they Google and Amazon and Apple on uh, this side of the uh, Pacific, or maybe uh, um, we, <laughs> WeChat, uh, sorry, uh, Tencent, uh, Baidu, or others on the, uh, or, or, or in Asia. Um, not really many European giants, but uh, that may change in the future. Um, that tech infrastructure is now going to underlie the future of healthcare. What do I mean by that? Well, we're going to add different types of technology to all different parts of society. So healthcare is not just going to be in the hospital or in the uh, physician's office or whatever different type of arrangement you have in your country. We're now going to start to say that the technology layer is going to underpin everything and that's where most healthcare is going to be delivered. We're actually seeing the technology layer itself break up into many different types, including uh, data storage, such as data stored in the cloud, uh, a whole idea of transactions uh, being recorded and created, maybe, maybe in the electronic medical record, maybe elsewhere. Um, that data being exchanged between different types of services, different types of organization, and uh, then that data being analyzed, you hear the words AI a great deal, um, but also uh, 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 analytics, helping do things like um, do augmenting reality and other things. Um, and then finally, we're changing the way we interface with technology. And I'll talk more about this a, a bit later on, but we're, gonna, we're thinking about the ways that we're gonna interface with technology. Initially, it was a keyboard. Um, then it started being uh, you know, a, a something like uh, one of these mobile phones. Um, now we're talking about voice or maybe augmented reality or even virtual reality. Uh, and we're delivering sensors in great numbers across the home, of course, many, many people now have got different types of sensors in their home. And increasingly homes and uh, healthcare facilities and other areas are becoming very smart based on the different types of sensors that, uh, that exist. Um, and those are both going you know, around the home, on the human body and inside the human body. Um, that may even be a different type of interface layer. So my argument is that with all this technology around, we're starting to build a technology platform that is wherever a patient can be. And we're gonna start using that technology to be measuring and tracking patients the, in the entire time. And this goes both for patients with chronic illness like diabetes or heart conditions or asthma, as well as patients who are increasingly you know, suffering from um, infectious diseases such as COVID-19 and any other infectious diseases we're gonna have uh, as future pandemics come down the path. Now, of course, that technology platform isn't enough we are also going to require services on top of that. And that may be uh, human services or it may be uh, services coming virtually. Um, and then finally, of course, we're never going to get away completely from that face-to-face -face care delivery. There will be hospitals, there will be physicians offices. We will have patients and doctors together in the same room, uh, but we're not going to have them as the first thing we do. They're going to be in some ways the last thing we do. And there may even be only after these other things like the technology platform 
and the services we can otherwise deliver have failed. And you might argue that care delivery, a hospital admission, uh, a visit to a doctor in their office is actually a, a failure point. So this is what I call flipping the stack. And Indu Savar and I have devised this uh, notion about three years ago. We've been talking fairly uh, constantly about this over the last uh, few years. What's going on in that stack flipped organization? Well, many things. But probably the most important thing is that there are four Ms for patients. The technology is always measuring, it's always messaging, it's always monitoring, and it's always managing what's going on. Uh, with those patients and whether you have a relatively simple chronic illness that's under control and need to be uh, have your blood sugar monitored um, or automatically maybe by a sensor or a watch maybe by continuous blood glucose monitor or your blood pressure there are now devices connected to all this sort of stuff somebody in the background of that technology layer is going to be measuring messaging you and messaging other people about you monitoring and managing you and that of course gets much and much more intense as you move into uh, potentially fatal um, infectious diseases like COVID. So I've been thinking about that platform for a while, and a few months back in uh, June, uh, there was some a lot of articles about how do you deal with patients with COVID in quarantine. Um, and really, we've done a very poor job in the U.S. and in many other areas of how to in much better. It's been done much better in some countries like South Korea and New Zealand and elsewhere. But the U.S. in particular, but also I'd argue the U.K. and Sweden and uh, um, some other countries have really done a very poor job in trying to figure out how to isolate and quarantine people who may or may not be suffering from COVID. Um, and the result has been that we've seen a lot of people who are clearly COVID positive out and spreading the conditions. And right now, as I talk in, uh, in, in, in late July, uh, the U.S. across its southern states has got a massive outbreak. Of, of, of COVID. So I wrote this article about, well, how do you actually, you know, um, manage this process smartly? What is the organization that you require to think about managing people in quarantine? And as I've developed this uh, theory and the talk I'm about to conclude with now, it's become apparent that it's not just patients who have uh, infectious disease or COVID who need to be uh, managed smartly where they are. It's actually almost every patient, almost all of us should have this kind of monitoring and management going on. Now, if you're a generally healthy person in their mid 50s like me, you probably don't need much in the way of managing and monitoring. You need a little bit of prodding from the automated devices. You need a little bit of suggestion that I should be doing something differently, that I should be eating better and exercising more. There's things I should do. And of course, that gets much, much more intense if I have a chronic disease like diabetes or heart failure or I have a mental health condition. I need a lot more interaction with the system. And that may be with just a pure technology interaction. Something might be self-service or monitoring me, something that's automated. It might be more of a, or it might be more of a human service, whether it's somebody, uh, a coach connecting with me over WhatsApp or over the internet or over Zoom or what have you. Or, or it may be that I might need active people to come, medical professionals to come to my house and deal with me. But there's a whole series of things that need to be done. Now, as I said, that might be that you have a severe acute condition, it might be that you're in hospital, maybe you have a chronic disease. We are starting to have to build the applications and the services um, for all these different types of patients. And that's really gonna be, I think, the future of, of healthcare. What have we got so far? Well, particularly in the US, but in many other countries, we've seen a considerable system failure. Don't have to over elaborate on this, but I mean, we've had people in the US sent home uh, to die when they should have been kept under observation somewhere, sent home and told the call back if they had a, if their problems got worse, but in fact they would died. Um, you have hospitals who can't manage the flow of patients they've had in them. We've had uh, patients sent out of hospitals into nursing homes and infecting uh, nursing homes and senior cares and dramatic rates uh, in the US, but also in the UK and Italy and elsewhere of serious problems and lots of people dying in elderly senior, uh, seniors dying in nursing homes. Um, we've had all different types of problems, especially in the US with people who, have, uh, who are of lower secular economic status uh, or racial minorities, like folks who are black or Hispanic, who've been hit much harder by the coronavirus. And of course, with the Black Lives Matter 
movement going around the world, we know that's not just for coronavirus that they've had these problems. So what do we do about this? Well, I think we need to rechange healthcare completely and get away from the notion of hospitals, doctors, and others as managing healthcare, and instead think about new organizations. So I'm arguing we need something called the Patient Location Independent Care Integration Management Organization. I started calling that the uh, Plikimo at one point, but I was told that was a pretty bad name. And so now I'm calling this the Continuous Clinic. What does a continuous clinic need? It needs a bunch of different things to be done. And here are several, there may be more, but here's my starter list. It needs to be, uh, and here's one example of it, maybe one, one way we could think about it. It needs a series of communication devices, physical services and support for the patient who's over here on the left, a lot of sensing devices, a lot of processes in the middle to manage that, a lot of connection with uh, both uh, automated and tech automated care staff. So I'm gonna unpack this a bit and talk about the different components of this in the rest of my talk. First off, we now have cheap and reliable, almost professional grade in many cases, measuring devices that are now connected to the internet. So from the top of this screen, we have uh, this is a thermometer from Withings. Uh, we have various dev monitoring devices. This is a relatively cheap from Butterfly Networks ultrasound that can be dispatched to the home. Um, this is a, a tool from Massimo, which uh, makes those pulse ox uh, devices. This is, a, this is their sort of uh, um, tool called Doctella, which is a uh, monitoring system. And down here we have a, a tool called the Cardia, uh, which is for monitoring uh, EKGs. So you have a series of patient monitoring devices. These all need to be brought together. They need to be easily supplied to patients wherever they are and brought together. There are a ton more than these that I haven't got here, but you get the idea. Then you need the concept of telehealth and virtual care. Um, we've seen telehealth explode over the COVID period, but it's mostly been uh just simple like what we're doing now simple video to video replacing real life and it's got to be a lot more than that it's got to have included behind it a lot of workflow to think about how to move the right patient to the right doctor at the right time um, and here's one example of a company that's doing that it's a company called blue stream health i was involved with them a little while ago um, and they worked with a large hospital chain in the u.s around the washington dc area called medstar health and they were able to build a real-time provisioning engine, which brought several clinics, hospitals, patients, home care, all online together and got, essentially, if you got into that system, you were able to get a, in front of a human being on the screen very quickly, very easily, who was the right person for you, whether they were a specialist in mental health, uh, an emergency room doctor, an interpreter, or whatever you needed. And they've built that workflow that needs to provision all of this telehealth and virtual care. So that's one thing that needs to be done. That's not enough though. You also need behind the scenes automated care processes to know who should be seeing what patient at what time and also to understand that so that you can automatically say if we have a patient with diabetes and they go to this certain level of, of blood sugar or we have someone with heart failure and they have a certain level, certain monitoring uh, gets to a certain level, they get pushed to the right place and they get an automated visit whether it be virtual or they get someone coming to the house or whatever it happens to be this is a care process again from the folks at, at blue stream when they put out and it's, this is just to get uh three different nursing home facilities with four different patients four different physicians visiting them and it's a question of how do you manage this all this has to be mapped out and run by the system so there's a lot of complexity behind the scenes in these care processes and of course that's not enough you also need actual humans uh, care staff, whether they be, you know, like this highly paid, if he's an actor or, or a doctor, I don't know, looking at, you know, in his bunker, looking at the various um, information he's getting from a care visit, a look at the data he's getting from various systems, helped by technology and alerted by technology, or whether it be uh, staff who may be having to visit the home, and they may be, you know, highly paid, highly trained nursing staff, or they may be the Amazon driver 
dropping off a test kit or dropping off food, you know, or an Uber driver dropping off food. Whatever you need, you're going to have to supply the right things to those patients, depending on their acuity level and what they can do. All of this, and you've seen this chart earlier, has to go into an open technology stack so they can all talk to each other. And all up and down that chain, and there are many, many other parts of this. I mean, I haven't really put the, uh, the, the, the telehealth companies into this, but the, or the interface, but they're in the interface layer as well. But you need to have all of this technology brought together and all these different companies, you know, just, and just a few of the thousands of companies we follow at, at, uh, at Health 2.0 and at uh, Smack Health need to be up and down this, uh, need to be up and down this chain. What's going on here is that somebody has got to build a stack where you can easily get all the open APIs from all these systems and bring them all together on an as needed basis. So that's going to be, a, again, a big issue. And the same organization, any technology, so any management organization is going to have to manage that technology. It's a big part of what it does. And then, of course, behind the scenes, that technology has to get smarter. And the only way that's going to happen is if we really improve our AI. So this is uh, my little joke photo of a robot getting smarter by reading a bunch of books. But the most important thing we can probably do is develop, as we get information in from patients and run it through those automated care processes, is to get AI smarter and smarter about acuity levels. So we know who needs what intervention when before it's too late. So if somebody's pulse ox uh, numbers are dropping, their oxygen levels are going down, and they have COVID, we need to know what's happening sooner rather than later, so we can get them appropriate treatment, if necessary, get them into an ICU to get them on the ventilator or get them treated with whatever the latest drugs are, uh, as opposed to waiting. We need to start being able to predict that rather than react to that. And that's, I think, where AI, we hear a lot about AI in healthcare is really gonna come in. And one more thing, and again, this may be more particular for the US than it is for some other countries, but we bill for healthcare and we pay for healthcare in a very, very convoluted way here. Um, this is just a couple of examples of some lab billing and some uh, patient, patient information. In the US, if you go to a, uh, if you have a, a procedure in hospital, you'll get dozens of bills coming, not just from the hospital for what happened to you in the hospital, but also from the doctors who saw you there. And maybe the people who delivered you medical equipment afterwards. And maybe in the, the doctors will bill you separately from the hospital. And everyone in America is completely confused by this. It's better in other countries, but we still have billing and insurance in most other countries, and everyone needs to get paid. One way we're gonna deal with the cost of healthcare is to get rid of this administrative complexity and put that in the same organization that enables you to, to, to put all these other pieces together, this continuous clinic. It's gonna to have to manage the payment system um, and get paid by the end payer, whether it's a government, or a consumer or an employer in a way that it manages all the parts behind the scene, parts behind the scene. I liken this to any of you who've, you know, had renovations to your house or anybody who's built a large building professionally knows that you don't, the, the one person doesn't manage every little part of this yourself. You have a general contractor who manages all the subcontractors and makes all that complexity behind the scenes go away. So, that's a big part of what this continuous clinic is going to do. So I hope you get gives you some sense of the different parts here that I think are going to have to be in one organization. All the new technologies, which are going to be touching the patients and, the, and of course, their caregivers. Um, the communication to telehealth systems, connecting them with the virtual telecommunicated care staff. The physical service and support, whatever they be, going to the home, to the nursing home, to the hospital, to wherever the patient is staying, the hotel where the patient is staying, um, and all the technology systems behind the scenes which are making uh, the trains run on time, making the right things happen, including that sort of AI prediction of acute admission, and including all those automated care processes with the alerts and the payment administration they're doing. So this is, to my mind, what the future healthcare organization is gonna be. It's not gonna be a hospital, it's not an insurance company, it's gonna be this continuous clinic which is gonna manage various different types of patients. Now, to get there, that's not enough, right? We need other things to make this happen. And whether you're in Asia, Europe, uh, North America, South America, wherever you are in the world, you need, certain, you need a system that puts this in place in two big areas. Um, we have the technology, the $6 million man, we have the technology, we can put this in place, 
but only if we put both payment and legislation reg regulation in the right order to make it happen. So the first one I want to talk about is legislation. And I'm just going to tell you, about, I'm not going to talk about the whole world's legislation regulation, but in the US, we're kind of creeping towards this. We largely have a fee-for-service intervention-driven system, but um, we've had recently the 21st Century Cures Act, which has started uh, to, to demand that data flows between systems. We have uh, something which is the, involves something called the TEFCA framework, which is really going to help move data around. We have FIRE, which is an international standard for moving data between different, different types of clinical data around, which is going to make it easier to access data to make that open stack work that we talked about earlier. And we're starting to get some enforcement of people who are trying to hoard data and hoard access to patients because they have access to data and allow these new kinds of organizations to get the data together and move data between um, different services to build that continuous clinic. So that's sort of half the equation. Can you get the regulation and the enforcement in place that allows the data and the patients and the technologies to flow freely? The second part of course is, is money. Um, if you have a very high bound payment system as we do have in the US, one thing you can do is to start to try to break that up by allowing uh, having the government or employers or insurance companies pay for new types of things. So, you know, one thing that's happening in the US slowly is that we're starting to pay for re remote patient monitoring uh, or continuous care management. There are actually codes now in the old system where you can pay for things like uh, calls. We also have, have seen a lot more freedom in, in how you can both regulate and pay for telehealth which means you can pay for telehealth visits. It used to be confined to only people in rural areas or what have you. Uh, now it's uh, uh, much freer and likely to be um, a mainline form of payment. And eventually we're gonna move in the US, I hope to something close to our Medicare Advantage for all system, or maybe even universal insurance, which basically means that the government would set ways for how organizations, whether they be health plans or continuous clinics or whatever you wanna call them, would get paid and you would get paid more like a lump sum and then be at risk for all the activity that happened, which would mean the organizations like the continuous clinic would be able to start figuring out how, what is the best use of that money and what's the best use of technology to manage those individual patients rather than figuring out how do I get paid the most for this patient by doing whichever procedure or whichever intervention or whichever type of visit. And that's been a huge problem, particularly in the US, but also in other countries. So we need to get these three things right. We need to get that management organization, the continuous clinic in the middle. We need to sort of the payment system. And we also need to see sort of the regulation system. But I think we can do that. And I'll leave you with one thought, which is we have a lot of organizations which might be the birth of this place, this continuous clinic. And I don't know who's gonna do this. I suspect a mix of people will. But in the US in particular, but also globally, we have a lot of interesting players who could get involved. So top left of this screen, I've just put four of them up here. The top left, you know, we have the, the giant technology companies, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Apples, the Amazons, all of those players. Uh, are they likely to be able to uh, put together all the different pieces here? Maybe. Some of them are starting to make those strides. They clearly are very in touch with consumers. Many of them are building medical devices like Apple are. Many of them are putting records together like Apple is and to some extent Microsoft. You're starting to see them working with uh, new startup medical clinics. So, you know, it might be those folks who build the continuous clinic. Top right, the major people play, major players, most across the world, including the US, are large incumbent provider organizations, hospitals, hospitals and doctors working together. I think it's gonna be very hard for them to change what they do every day and become more like these continuous clinics that are focused on patients independent of their facilities and get away from their hospital admissions and ideas of making it doing individual procedures and getting paid for those, but it's possible they might. In the US, we also have significantly huge retail organizations um, and health insurance plans, the incumbent large for-profit healthcare companies. CVS, the biggest uh, retail pharmacy chain in the US, the retail chemist, just bought one of the big health plans, Aetna, and it's got a lot of the pieces on board to do that. Optum, which is part of the United Health Group, huge insurance company, now has not only insurance, but also owns 
thousands of physician practices and have started to buy a lot of the technology in place to do this together. So you can imagine that they might be purveyors of this continuous clinic. And then finally, of course, you've got the people who started with healthcare, right? Doctors, doctors, clinicians. Um, um, there are many now physician-driven organizations in the U.S. and elsewhere, but predominantly in the U.S., who are building their own systems and are building primary care systems and beginning to take on risk. And you can imagine them making the leap to start to monitor patients wherever they are and what they need to be done for. Um, and there are organizations like uh, ALD and others who are helping, who are venture-backed and are helping these, uh, these independent physicians do this. And you're seeing, you're just seeing some interesting combinations just in the last few weeks. Walgreens, one of the big, huge pharmacy chains, has done a big deal with one of these physician organizations called Physician D. And both uh, Amazon has done a deal with a, with a physician organization uh, called Crossover Health. And even Walmart, uh, the biggest retailer in the US, is starting to roll out some physician patient care management services as well. So who knows exactly who's going to be the player, who's going to, quote unquote, win to get this. But I think all these organizations are going to be pushing towards managing that, you know, using that technology to create this continuous clinic, because that's really what we need to do uh, to, to get to the future of healthcare. So uh, these are my details. Please feel free to connect with me. I'm at Balti Boy on Twitter. You can find me at massiumassiumhealth.net via email. Um, you can please come and take a look at the healthcare blog, uh, where all of this is, is, uh, is featured. Um, you'll see on that my um, a little jokey roundup of health technology news called Health in 2.0, which I do with Jester Massa. Um, please connect with me. Please, uh, if you're interested in this type of tool, let me, let me know what exciting things you're doing and how you're working in this whole new healthcare environment. And maybe together we can help to put all this continuous clinic, put some of these new technologies into place and make the experience much, much better for patients who have chronic illness or, or, or are suffering from acute problems and really need a whole new healthcare system to improve their life. And with that, I thank you for your time. Really enjoyed speaking with you and I look forward to uh, touching base either in the future or in the Q&A.